based on their functions we have different types of energy giving food i'll just write down the nutrients can be of three types energy giving food then body building nutrients then protective and regulating nutrients the nutrients which are giving us protection protection from various infection so protection giving nutrients energy giving food that there are some type of food which directly give us energy then that means we eat carbohydrates we eat fats so those carbohydrates and fats actually when we are short of energy we are feeling very dull if you eat any carbohydrate or fat fatty things you get instant energy you can say carbohydrates and fats give us energy instantly so these are the examples of energy giving foods body building nutrients or body building food so those people who are body builders wrestlers they eat lot of proteins and those proteins are coming from pulses basically pulses are giving us lot of proteins and this we can say pulses of protein giving food so this give us uh, proteins provide us the body with a lot of muscle power and that is required by the wrestlers so they take more of proteins than carbohydrates protection giving nutrients we have to protect ourselves from various infections and infections are coming through microorganisms but if we increase our immunity now what is immunity to fight against the disease so that immunity to develop we should eat vegetables and fruits so these are the different types of nutrients which we should take in our diet that's why indian food is considered to be the most balanced diet because in our food we take dal chawal sabzi roti together with all the salads also fruits also so these this type of indian food is considered to be a balanced food because we are taking carbohydrates also fats also proteins also vegetables also fruits also in our diet these are the three types of nutrients now as i said these nutrients are of three types these nutrients also depend on from where they are obtained so i can say nutrients can be of two types inorganic and organic so nutrients can be of two types organic and inorganic now which are the producers of food if i say what which are the producers of food you will say plant is the producer it is called the producer of the food why because plants are the living things which contain chlorophyll and they make their own food the herbivores eat plants and these herbivores are eaten by carnivores and so on this food chain goes on the inorganic nutrients are available to the plants through air and through soil now once they take in they process and make the food and the food which is made is organic food so this type of two nutrients are there inorganic nutrients and organic nutrients welcome back students to so this lesson lesson 10 life's internal secrets as we were discussing last time there are different types of nutrients which are giving us health healthy life now there are organic nutrients there are inorganic nutrients we had seen in the last time today we are going to st study what are the nutrients giving us are they giving us some raw materials to sustain life what are the types of nutrition and actually what is nutrition 
Now, what is nutrition? What do you think? What is nutrition? We are going to study about nutrition in animals, nutrition in plants. But what is nutrition? Nutrition is the process of intake of food. When we take in food and then we utilize it for our energy production, that is nutrition. What is nutrition giving us? Nutrition is giving us the raw material to sustain life or our life should go on working and this is given by the raw materials which the nutrients are giving us. Can we take nutrition in any way? Plants have the different way, animals have different way. So the way in which they take nutrients is called mode of nutrition. So first you have to understand what is nutrition the process of intake of nutrients and its utilization by the body is called nutrition and the way by which we take in food is called mode of nutrition. Now there is an activity in your book on page 116 116 activity 10.3 this small puzzle for you the first one we prepare our own food by using simple inorganic substances now what are we eating we are eating basically plants and animals when i say we we are talking about uh, human beings but here the hint given is we prepare our own food by using simple inorganic substances so the clue given is all jumbled words the answer to it is plants now what are plants doing plants are utilizing inorganic substances present in the air present in the soil and then they are making them into or converting them into carbohydrates and this they are doing with some pigments present there so they are the plants and plants is the answer which are utilizing inorganic substances as their nutrient raw materials second activity we use complex substances break them down into simple ones and then use them for upkeep and growth now the jumbled words if you just try to figure it out it is animals now from this activity you come to know what is the difference between plant nutrition and animal nutrition now basically plants are the producers of energy when i say producers that means the plants can manufacture their own food now how do they manufacture their own food just like that no they have to use some of the raw materials present in the air or in the soil which can come through water in their body so they are utilizing carbon dioxide and water in the presence of sunlight to prepare a carbohydrate and this is how the food is prepared by plants and thus the plants are known as autotrophs plants are called as autotrophs auto means by their own so they make the food by their own and therefore the plants are called as autotrophs and this mode of nutrition is called as autotrophic mode of nutrition autotrophic mode of nutrition Now, if you are asked a question, what are autotrophs? So, you should be able to answer, autotrophs are the plants which utilize the raw materials present in the air and the soil to make their own food. That means they are utilizing the sun's energy to convert these raw materials into carbohydrates. And therefore, they are called as autotrophs and this mode of nutrition is called as autotrophic mode of nutrition. Then, how is it different from the animals? Now, can animals utilize carbon dioxide and water converted into carbohydrate? No. Animals and human beings cannot do so. Why? Why plants can do and animals can't do? Because plants contain chlorophyll. Now, this chlorophyll is the green pigment. which helps in converting this raw materials into carbohydrates with the help of sunlight. Photosynthesis or synthesis of food 
by the plants happens only in the presence of sunlight otherwise it cannot take place so can you tell me in what time of the day the photosynthesis is possible photosynthesis is possible only during the daytime when the sunlight is there at night only respiration goes on in plants but no photosynthesis goes on in plants so this is the difference autotrophs are the plants which are preparing their own food these plants can prepare their own food because they contain chlorophyll which is a green pigment and this mode of nutrition of preparing their own food is called as autotrophic mode of nutrition then how it is different from animals now animals actually are called heterotrophs animals and human beings come under heterotrophs now why we are called heterotrophs hetero means depending on others the animals and human beings they cannot prepare their own food they have to depend on other organisms for their food and therefore they are called as heterotrophs and the mode of nutrition some animals can attack an another animal and uh, then chew it and then take it inside some animals like fungi which are the microscopic they actually break down the complex substances outside only outside the body and then change it into simple forms and then take inside and there are some animals or some parasites actually which enter the host body extract their all the nutrients and in that process harm the organism also so there are three ways of mode of nutrition by heterotrophs this is heterotrophic mode of nutrition so heterotrophic mode of nutrition is seen in animals and human beings and these animals and human beings since they cannot prepare their own food they have to depend on other organisms other organisms means they can they, they have to depend either on plants or animals so when they depend on other organisms they follow the mode of nutrition which is called as heterotrophic mode of nutrition so there are three ways first directly by killing them or what we they do they um, take they chew it in they chew the food and take it inside and then convert the complex into simple so we can say inside the body inside the body means all humans and animals bigger animals what are they doing they are eating the plants if it is a leafy vegetable or some other vegetable or if they are eating any non vegetarian food they are eating they are chewing it they are taking it inside then that complex substance is changing into simpler ones so this is inside the body now sometimes they break it outside only now what does it mean when they break it outside the food there are some mushrooms some fungi the mushrooms are also fungi so fungi like yeast mushroom what do they do what they do is they break down the complex substances outside and then make it into simple and then they absorb it so these type of uh, mode of nutrition takes place outside the food outside the body for example fungi like yeast mushrooms now third type of mode of nutrition is they don't kill they don't chew they don't kill anyone they don't chew anything what they do they directly act on the host organism and then draw the nutrients by sucking it so they attack the host organism inside their body and then there is no killing without killing so you can say examples are cascuta now cascuta is a plant 
which, which is growing on another plant. It's a parasitic plant. It's a yellow color tube-like structure. It's also called in Hindi Amarvel. So this cascuta is a plant which grows on other plant, directly takes the nutrients from that plant, and that plant itself starts wilting. That means it spoils the plants. Then another example is lice. Lice is nothing but jue, which is generally found in, in the hair. What does lice do? Lice also sucks the blood from our skin. They are living in these hair, but they are actually attacking the skin and sucking blood. Then another example is ticks. Now ticks are the small, small insects which are found on the hairs of the animals. If you have a pet dog at home, lot of ticks might develop on his hair and those ticks are also actually drawing the nutrients from their blood by sucking it. Then another example is leech, leeches. Leech are the organism which stick to your body like this. You cannot remove it very easily. It's very difficult to remove leech if it gets stuck to your body. What does leech do? Leech also sucks blood from your body. Then another example is tapeworm. Tapeworm is very flat and it is, looks like a tape. It enters your body through water or food and then it attacks your digestive system and directly take nutrition from your blood or directly take nutrition from your digestive system. And this tapeworm is also a parasite. So the examples which I have shown are all parasites. They need not kill anyone. They directly attack the organism and draws the nutrients from them. But now we have seen autotrophic, we have seen mode, heterotrophic mode of nutrition. But do all the animals follow this? Yes, to a some extent, heterotrophs will follow the same procedure. Now heterotrophs, in heterotrophs, cascuta is also coming, lice is also coming, humans are also coming, other higher animals are also coming. Now, as the complexity of the body increases, the complexity of the body means if I am talking about a small tapeworm to a human being, there is a lot of difference. A tapeworm is a worm. Okay, ticks are the insects. Now, housefly is a small fly, but humans are quite big. So, our body has more complex systems than these animals, though they also are having a mode of nutrition. So, as the complexity of the body increases, it depends on their body designing or depends on uh, various functioning of the body. There are some specific features of taking in food and utilizing it. Now I am taking in food, I am eating some food. I will, what will I will do? I will just chew it. Then I will gulp it down. Then once it goes into the stomach, then it has to absorb, then it has to assimilate, then it has to extra, has to come out. So there are some various steps which are common to all the heterotrophs. Now what are those steps which are common to all heterotrophs? We will see one by one. So what are the basic steps in nutrition? Now we are talking about animal nutrition or here we are going to focus also on humans. The basic steps in nutrition in animals, now it remains same generally. Most of the animals will follow these basic steps. The difference will be in the types of enzymes which are coming out or the type of digestive juices there will be difference in this but the basic steps remain the same first is ingestion now what is ingestion it is an english word what is ingestion ingestion is only the act of taking food inside i i have food plate in front of me right now i want to eat what will i do i'll bite it i will first take it in my hand I will put it in the mouth and that means I have taken the food inside. When I take the food inside, the act of taking food inside is simple ingestion which all animals do. Either they catch hold of the prey, either they break the food and then eat anyway. But first step will be ingestion taking in the food. Second part or the second step is digestion. Now here. As soon as the food comes inside the mouth, what is happening first, the mechanical breaking of the food takes place. 
mechanical breaking means we have to use our teeth to mechanically break it now it has to be broken from big pieces to small pieces and then it is passed on to your stomach in the stomach actually the complex substances are changed or broken down into simpler forms so we can say that first mechanically it is uh, broken down by teeth and secondly chemically by enzymes so I can uh, first I will write down mechanically by teeth and chemically by enzymes so you can say digestion involves first I have taken the food inside now I have to eat it now eat it means I am using my teeth to chew it so the teeth are doing the work of mechanical breaking down when mechanically it is breaking down the bigger particles into smaller ones now it is gulped down and it is sent to the stomach where the enzymes are released and this is the chemical reaction which where it starts so chemically the digestion takes place by enzymes then third is absorption now the digestion is over now suppose I say mechanically it is done chemically the enzymes are acted on over the food now the food has been converted into simpler substances now these simpler substances have to be absorbed in the blood uh, if it doesn't reach the blood how it will go to different cells and tissues so the absorption means the conversion of the food a uh, digested food and getting it absorbed by the blood so it has to be absorbed by the blood so in the absorption part we are going to see how the uh, simpler substances are actually passed on to the blood or the nutrients are passed on to the blood the next part or next is assimilation now assimilation in absorption it is absorbed by blood right the complex is complex substances are converted to simpler digestion is complete digestion is complete then the nutrients are sent to the blood now each and every cell and each and every tissue should reach should get all the absorbed food or the nutrients which are available so when the food is absorbed by the blood and then it is reaching the cells and the tissues that is called as assimilation now this it is transported to tissues now when it is transported to tissues what is happening the lot of energy is produced and that energy is used for growth energy produced is used for growth so every every age the child is eating every person is eating food at every age food is very necessary to give out energy now where is this energy used energy is used for the growth and the development growth and development of body now this energy is totally not used it is used for growth and development of body but this energy is also stored in our body so also for storage of energy so this is the fourth step in the process of nutrition in all the animals the fifth step and final step is egestion now we have eaten food we have digested it we have absorbed it we have assimilated it but in this all process lot of waste is produced the waste is produced in the form of fiber which is not digested by our body it is produced in the form of urea uric acid and many other things which are not absorbed by the body and those waste materials 
have to be sent out of the bl blood and sent out of the body so that it does not produce toxic substance. Now, when I say toxic, toxic means it produce, starts producing poison if these waste products are remaining in your body. So waste products have to be ejected out or it has to be sent out of the body. Removal of waste product. So this is the fifth and final step of the basic steps in nutrition in animals. When we talk of animal nutrition, we should know that there are four, five steps which are very important and almost same in all the animals. Ingestion which is taking in food, digestion in which first we are mechanically breaking down by teeth and then we are chemically breaking down by enzymes. Then absorption, it is absorbed by blood, now digested food has to go somewhere, it, it is going to go in the blood. This blood is going to transport it to the tissues and this tissue when it is getting transported to tissue what about the energy produced? The energy produced is used for growth and development of the body and also for storage of energy. Now all these processes have taken place side by side large amount of waste product is also product, produced and that waste products are uh, urea, uric acid, fibers, fibrous things unwanted which are not actually which are not digested by the body all this should be removed because they might produce toxins in our body toxins are nothing but poisonous substances so this is the final stage that is ejection now we are going to deal with the nutrition in human beings now the nutrition as i said it is the intake of food and how it is transported to your body the whole process is called as nutrition now in that nutrition, we are going to study about human digestive system. The human digestive system actually is formed by various organs. As you see in the diagram which I have made for you, there are various different organs. One organ does not form the digestive system. There is number of organs which are associated with each other which forms the whole digestive system. Now this digestive system can be broadly divided into two types, elementary canal and the digestive glands. So I can say digestive system includes first elementary canal Second, digestive glands. When I say the digestive system includes two parts, that means first is elementary canal and second is digestive glands. Now, this what I have drawn is actually both. Elementary canal includes when we take the food in from the mouth, that means the pipe which starts from the mouth and goes till the anus is completely called as elementary canal. The most common mistake which children make is if I am asking you a question what is elementary canal? Draw elementary canal. So what children do? They only draw this part. They think this tube actually is elementary canal. Oh, this tube is a part of elementary canal. Elementary canal right starts from the oral cavity that means the mouth Till the onus. So, in the anus, all the different parts are actually the elementary canal. The difference is that it is broad at some end or it is narrow at some end. So, it depends on the size and the function where it becomes broad and where it becomes narrow. But the whole tube, right from the mouth till the anus, together is called as elementary canal. So, this mistake should not be done. The elementary canal is the whole thing. Second is digestive glands. Now what are glands? The glands are the, some, are the organs which are actually producing a enzy enzymes and hormones which are helping in the digestion. Now here I have drawn liver. This is one of the digestive gland. 
Here I have drawn pancreas. This is also a digestive gland. Then there are some digestive gland which are actually inside the stomach. So from the stomach, they are giving out some uh, enzymes or some digestive juices. And therefore, these are also one of the digestive glands. Then I have drawn salivary glands. What is saliva? Saliva thunki. So that saliva, when we talk, we see that some liquid is always coming out of the mouth. When we eat, some liquid is always mixing with the food. So that liquid is secreted from salivary glands. So what are, saliva, what are the glands which are associated with digestive system? The glands are salivary glands which are mixing the saliva, then liver which is actually mixing the bile juice, then pancreas which are actually mixing many of the enzymes which we are going to learn and the gastric juices inside the stomach. And these are the digestive glands which are associated with digestive system. So if you are talk, if you are asked about what is digestive system including or what is included inside the digestive system. So you can say two main things are there, elementary canal and digestive system. If you are asked to draw the complete label diagram of elementary canal and along with it the digestive glands, you have to draw this simple figure. Do not make it very complicated, draw the simple figure and try two or three times you will get it. One important thing, the figure has to be drawn and all the labeling should be on one side. Do not label here, there, here, there. You will lose marks for it. So try to label very nicely on one side that is on the right side of the diagram and in one line how I have done. So this looks neat and clean and you get full score. Now even if your drawing is not so good but then your labeling is correct then also you are getting full marks for it. So these are the tips which I am giving. Draw the diagram as simple as you can. Then draw all the parts properly. Label all the parts on the right side and in line. Do not label half here, half there, half down, half right. So it becomes very untidy and even if your answer is correct, even if your labeling is correct, you may lose some marks for untidiness. So let's start with the first elementary canal. Now what is elementary canal? As I said, it is a long muscular tube. Now it is made up of muscles. Obviously it doesn't get, it is, it is not having any bone. It is a long muscular tube of varying diameter. Here you can see diameter is so thin. Here you see diameter has increased. Again it is increased, again it is decreasing. So it is of varying diameter from the mouth to the anus. The salivary glands, the liver, the pancreas and the gastric glands inside the stomach helps in the digestion of the food which is associated with the elementary canal. Now let me write the four parts. First is salivary glands. Second is liver. Third is pancreas. Fourth is gastric glands. Now gastric glands are present inside the stomach. Now come to the page number 117 or 117, activity 10.4. It will be becoming more and more clear what saliva does to your food. Now I will be reading out the activity 10.4 and will answer the questions. Take 1 ml of starch solution in 2 test tubes. Now they have asked, take 2 test tubes, okay, name them A and B. These are 2 test tubes. Now starch solution is taken in both. Starch solution is added. So activity is take two test tubes A and B, name them A and B, take starch solution in both, equal amount. Then add 1 ml of saliva to test tube A. So 1 ml saliva 
सलाइवा इज नथिंग बट अवर थुंकी और थूक जो आती है मुंह में दैट इज वन एम एल दैट इज एडेड इन द फर्स्ट टेस्ट ट्यूब विच कंटेन स्टार्च लीव बोथ द स्टेस्ट ट्यूब अनडिस्टर्ब फॉर ट्वेंटी टू थर्टी मिनट्स यू हैव टू एड दिस सलाइवा ओनली इन द ट्यूब ए नॉट इन द ट्यूब बी लीव इट अनडिस्टर्ब फॉर ट्वेंटी टू थर्टी मिनट्स से हाफ एन आवर now add a few drops of dilute iodine solution to the test tubes plus now add iodine solution to both test tubes now iodine solution is added to it is a called an iodine test to see where the carbohydrate is present or not now what is the color change you may find in test tube a and test tube b think about it we have taken starch solution in both test tubes a and b we have added 1 ml saliva to only a after 30 minutes we are adding iodine solution to both now what will happen wherever there is a carbohydrate Formed or carbohydrate is not sorry carbohydrate change into sugar, then what will happen? The starch is already a carbohydrate. It has to react with saliva. It will when starch reacts with saliva, it will form a form of sugar. And here there is no saliva added, so maybe there will no reaction will be seen. No saliva. So after thirty minutes, you are going to see that. color here is pale yellow and here it is bluish black so this is experiment where you are going to see what happens when saliva is added to starch starch is a carbohydrate here after 30 minutes when i add iodine solution to these test tubes this tube a color changes to pale yellow and b it remains bluish black what does this tell us it tells us that saliva has reacted with starch and converted into sugar so saliva has reacted with starch and converted into a sugar which is called as maltose so but what does saliva contain saliva has some enzymes which are called as salivary amylase so this reacts with the starch it has salivary amylase so when i have added saliva to the starch solution the saliva contains the salivary amylase and that digestive enzyme what is amylase it's a digestive enzyme which is digesting the food now starch is the food here so this saliva contains salivary amylase which reacts with the starch convert into sugar and that sugar is nothing but maltose and that maltose makes the iodine solution pale yellow in color so question next question is what conclusion can you draw from the presence of starch now after the reaction is over does a contain starch more no now once the starch has reacted with saliva starch has already converted to sugar so a does not contain starch now and b b shows the iodine test because iodine in the carbohydrate changes to bluish black so here still starch is present so this proves that saliva has reacted with starch and here where no saliva was added the iodine solution turned this solution into bluish black What does this tell us about the action of saliva on starch? We, it tells us that saliva has some enzyme which is a digestive enzyme called as salivary amylase that reacts with starch and convert it into glucose that is maltose. So this happens when we start the digestion when we start the digestion of food in the mouth. That means what happens? I have taken the food in the mouth. I am chewing it. not chewing it with the help of teeth not this teeth is mechanically changing the bigger particles into smaller particles when it we are chewing the saliva is mixing in our food so when we eat food when actually when we smell food that time only the saliva is started secreting because that smell 
triggers the salivary glands and then that is called as saliva is coming. That saliva is already started mixing with the food when we start chewing it. When we chew it, the whatever carbohydrate we have eaten that reacts with the salivary amylase and then they convert into sugar. Now even if you eat a bhakri or a chapati without any vegetable, if you eat and chew, little sweetness come in your mouth. Now that sweetness is due to the formation of maltose or sugar which the saliva has reacted with the carbohydrate and converted into sugar. So in the mouth what has happened that when we eat a bhakri or a chapati, when we chew it, this salivary amylase starts reacting with our food that is the chapakri or chapati converts it into sugar and that is why we feel that we are something eating something sweet that sweet taste comes because of the formation of sugar by the action of salivary amylase now what is salivary amylase it's a digestive enzyme it's also called a biological catalyst i'll write down enzymes are also called biological catalyst enzymes are also called biological catalyst what is a catalyst the catalyst is a substance which actually does not take part in a reaction but it speeds up the reaction or it changes the rate of reaction or it helps in the formation of products so the catalyst is nothing but a substance which does not take part in a reaction but it speeds up the reaction the enzymes which the enzymes one exa enzyme which we saw which is present in the saliva is salivary enzyme salivary enzyme are also called as biological catalyst now what is salivary enzyme doing what is it doing it is converting carbohydrate to sugar so i can say as soon as i take in food my digestion process starts how does it starts that means it is converting a carbohydrate into sugar into just simpler form so carbohydrate is changed into sugar or the starch which was present in bhakri or chapati or rice it has changed into sugar and this is the first step which is taking place in the mouth now we will take step by step the organs involved in the digestion of food. Now as I said or uh, you can see the oral cavity, the oral cavity means here when we, what we say is mouth. When I say mouth in biological term it is called as oral cavity from orally we are taking in the food. So first step is in the mouth. First step of digestion takes place in mouth, in mouth I will well, I'll repeat again in mouth as we take in food it mixes with the saliva when this saliva has salivary amylase that is the enzyme which breaks down the starch into sugar maltose and this step is taking place inside the mouth mouth also have teeth and those teeth what is the responsibility of teeth the teeth chew the food to a very grinded uh, position why because we cannot gulp down the big pieces it has to gulp down, it has to become very soft. Now suppose you think you are eating chapati and directly you gulp down, it will get stuck here. So it has to be mechanically broken down into small pieces. When it is broken down, it is mixing with food, it, become, it mixes with the saliva, it becomes very soft. Why? Because this elementary canal has esophagus which is a delicate organ. It is muscular, lined with very thin walls and if I am pushing the food directly inside without breaking, this might get ruptured. So the food has to pass through this esophagus in a very soft mucus way. That means the soft ball of food should enter the esophagus. Thus the digestion starts in the mouth itself. The second part, 
Now, what after the mouth, what is happening? Once the mouth, in the mouth, the chewing part is done, mixing part with the saliva is done, the food travels down. This food soft travels down. Once it travels down, it enters the stomach part. Now, second, which we are going to learn is stomach. What happens in stomach? The part of digestion or the process of digestion happening in stomach. What is it? Now, what happens in stomach? The food has entered the mouth. We have chewed it. We have mixed with saliva. saliva. Now, it has to enter the stomach. It will enter the stomach through a long pipe, which is a muscular pipe. This pipe we are talking about, which is called as esophagus. This esophagus is a muscular pipe. But these muscles have to work to send the food down the elementary canal. Now, how does it do? It has to move some way. So, what happens? It shows the rhythmic contraction and relaxation. Contraction means when you tighten your stomach there or you tighten your uh, muscles, it will push the food down. When you relax, the food will slide down. So, this is how continuous relaxation and continuous contraction takes place. That's called as rhythmic contraction. So, rhythmic. So, rhythmic contraction and relaxation. Rhythmic contraction and relaxation is shown by the muscles of esophagus which is pushing the food down. This food now enter, it is pushed down by this contraction and relaxation and it is pushed down into the J shaped stomach. Now generally the stomach is on the left side of your abdomen. This is the abdomen side. The abdomen on the left side of your abdomen, the stomach is present. Now this stomach, when it end, the food enters your stomach. Now when once it enters the stomach, the food starts churning. Now what is churning? We just move it round and round and round. That is called as churning. So what does what happens inside the stomach now? Now this stomach can, is having the gastric glands. Now this, these gastric glands secrete three types of solution or three types of substances into the stomach. Now once the food has entered, something has to act on it. Now what is acting on it? The lining, the, the lining of this stomach contains gastric glands and these gastric glands secrete HCl that is hydrochloric acid, then pepsin that is type of enzyme and third mucus. In the stomach, there are li in the lining of the stomach, you have gastric glands. These gastric glands ex uh, give out HCl that is hydrochloric acid, pepsin that is an enzyme and mucus that is a liquid which is keeping the substance moist or keeping the inside atmosphere moist. Now what is happening? Once now the food has entered through the rhythmic contraction and relaxation. Rhythmic contraction and relaxation is also called as peristaltic movement. So if you are asked the question, what is peristaltic movement? Where do you see it? So it should click in your mind that once you eat the food, the food has to pass from mouth to stomach through the contraction and relaxation of the muscle and this is called as peristaltic movement. It enters the stomach. Now in the stomach, the lining of the stomach contains gastric glands and these gastric glands are going to give out three types of things which are going to help in the digestion of food. First is HCl, second is pepsin and third is mucus. Now what is HCl and acid doing in stomach? What is the role of acid here? Now a role of acid is this HCl is creating a surrounding or an atmosphere for the pepsin to act. What is pepsin doing? Pepsin is acting on the proteins to break it down. So pepsin has to break down the proteins of the food and this is helped by HCl or hydrochloric acid. And what is mucus doing? Now mucus is released so that 
the HCL action on the walls is not so severe. HCL is acidic in nature, hydrochloric acid is acidic in nature. So what will happen? If the mucus is not released, the acidity of the stomach will increase. Now many times we complain that we have acidity problem, we have very burning sensation problem. Many people because of acidity they vomit also. So what is happening? Too much acid is produced in your body. And if too much acid is produced in your body and if mucus is not secreted, that acidity level increases. So actually what is mucus doing? Mucus is keeping this lining safe from HCL. So HCL main role is hydrochloric acid main role to help pepsin act on proteins. This is the important use of HCL. HCL actually helps to create a uh, surrounding where the pepsin can act on pepsin. Uh, pepsin can act on proteins. Mucus is keeping the lining of the stomach safe from HCL. Can you tell me another, just another use of HCL which is produced in your body? There, there is another use. Now when we are eating food, we are eating water, we are eating food. Now this food and water may contain microorganisms. So when microorganisms enter your stomach, the HCL is another having another work of killing those microorganisms. So microorganisms are killed by the action of acid. This acid is produced by the lining of the stomach. And this acid have two major functions. First major function is to help pepsin act on proteins. And second major function is to kill the microorganisms kill the harmful microorganisms which might enter through food and water and what is the function of pepsin now the pepsin function is to break down the proteins now finally those proteins are going to break down with the help of pepsin and changed into amino acids which we are going to learn later so amino acids are formed due to action of pepsin on proteins and mucus is only helping in keeping the lining of the stomach safe from HCL. Now the food is inside acted upon by gastric glands. Now here the churning of the food takes place. Lot of churning that means it is moving and moving and you know mixing with all the types of digestive glands. And this digestive glands or gastric glands which are secreting the HCL or pepsin and mucus nicely mixes. Now it enters through a tube into the this tubular structure which is called as small intestine. You can see the small black colored intestine I have made that is a small intestine. Now to pass it into the small intestine there is one constriction. If you can see I have drawn this very narrow. Now why I have drawn this narrow because this muscle is called as sphincter muscle. What is the work of sphincter muscle? As the stomach has some digestion taken place, the digested food, partly digested food has to enter the small intestine for complete digestion. So it, now it cannot just flow like this. Slowly, slowly the portion of food has to be flowed or transported into the small intestine. So the sphincter muscles actually restricts the continuous flow in small small portion it will allow the digested food to enter into the small intestine. Now what is this small intestine? This was about stomach. This is the second part of the digestive, uh, digestive organs which we are going to learn or yet we are learning. Third part where the food is entering now is the small intestine. Now small intestine, in the name is small intestine, but it is the biggest part of your digestive system. It is 5 to 6 meters long. So long it is that it is 5 to 6 meters long. 
this is one meter approximately you can imagine five times or six times of this it is so long five to six meters in length but then why it is called small intestine why it is not called large intestine this is called large intestine the naming has been done depending on its diameter the diameter this is diameter now if i say the diameter of small intestine is small and that is why the name small intestine is given and the diameter of big intestine is big so there it is a large intestine but small intestine is 5 to 6 meters long very long it is and but how does it fit into our abdomen it is tightly coiled like this it is coiled very near to each other i have shown some gaps but actually in our abdomen there are no gaps continuous small intestine is coiled round and round and this is how it is present in our abdomen now the, this length of small intestine does it change from animal to animal what do you think is it bigger in us or some other other animal or herbivores or carnivores actually the herbivores will have longer intestine small intestine and carnivores will have smaller small intestine can you tell me the reason for it now the herbivores what do they eat they eat grass and all the green things of green plants and green plants contain cellulose now cellulose contain lot of fiber to, to break down the cellulose and fiber it takes a large num amount of time and it takes a more process to break down the cellulose and fiber which the herbivores are eating and what are carnivores eating actually carnivores are eating the plants and animals which have already digested that so the, they have to digest the carbohydrates and proteins and fats which is taking less time as compared to the time taken by the herbivores so the herbivores will have longer intestine and the carnivores will have smaller intestine now as i said if the small intestine is big in size where does it matter it matters if it is a herbivore animal it is much longer as it has to digest the cellulose and the fiber which is very difficult to digest it takes a lot of time but in animals it has to convert carbohydrates and fats and proteins into the different forms so it's already made easier so in animals or in carnivores it takes less time to digest or it may be comparatively easy to digest but in plants it is comparatively difficult to digest now we come to small intestine this small intestine is the largest or very long part of the alimentary canal or the largest part of the alimentary canal it depends on which animal we are talking about in herbivore it will be more longer may be more than this 5 to 6 and 5 to 6 meters or even carnivores it may be 4 to 5 depends on which type of animal we are talking about now the complete digestion of food is taking place in small intestine now complete digestion means what we are eating carbohydrates we are eating fats we are eating proteins which are very important in our nutrition or the balanced diet contains these three so carbohydrates fats and proteins have to be completely design, digested in the small intestine but the food which is coming from this stomach is acidic in nature now why it was acidic in nature because this stomach had released hcl gas through gastric glands so this hcl had made the medium acidic now when the food starts coming inside the small intestine the acidic medium won't work now the medium in as if the medium is acidic the carbohydrate fats and proteins cannot be broken down so easily so the medium has to be changed now the medium has to be made alkaline so in the alkaline medium only it will work alkaline medium is required and here acidic medium is required so see the difference when it was the food is was in the stomach the acidic medium was required so the stomach produced hydrochloric acid hydrochloric acid 
Now, when from the stomach, the partly digested food is coming in the small intestine, it needs an alkaline medium for the action of uh, breaking down the carbohydrate, fats and proteins. So, here the action of liver comes. So, I have drawn a liver which is very easy to draw. Just draw a triangular shape and make the lines to show the outer part. This liver, what is the function of liver now? Now, liver, here also I have drawn liver. Liver is one of the glands or the digestive glands which is helping in the digestion. So, liver is producing bile juice. Liver produces bile juice which is stored in gallbladder. Okay, now this liver is producing bile juice which is again an enzyme which is stored in this gallbladder. This gallbladder is connected to a duct. Duct means a tube like structure. This is a tube like structure. It is connected and then it gets connected to another tube like structure which is called as a common duct. We are going to tell you what is common duct. But first, what is the function of liver? This liver to make it into an alkaline medium, it secretes bile juice which is alkaline or which is basic in nature. So, bile juice is secreted by liver which is alkaline in nature, it is stored in the gallbladder. Now, this gallbladder when it requires, when the digestion is requiring this alkaline medium, this bile juice is secreted by the liver, it passes through this duct which is called the bile duct. Duct means a tubular structure through which the flow of the enzyme can take place. So, this gallbladder is storing the bile juice which is passing through the bile duct. Now, after the bile duct, it is going to get connected to another duct which is called as common duct. Now, the name common duct comes means something else is also going to come into this common duct. So, this is the structure of liver where we can see easily the liver which is producing the bile juice which is stored in the gallbladder. From the gallbladder, it is coming in the bile duct and from the bile duct, it is coming in the common duct where it is going to get mixed with the small intestine. Now, we are seeing the digestive glands which are actually associated with this whole elementary canal. The digestive gland which we first saw was the liver. Now, liver has produced bile juice. Now, this bile juice is making the medium alkaline so that the breaking down of carbohydrate, fats and proteins becomes easier. This bile juice was stored in the gallbladder. The next second one is pancreas. What second one? The digestive gland which is very important. Here we have drawn a small red colored pancreas. But here we are going to see, uh, show you how pancreas are actually between the stomach and the small intestine. What is this pancreas doing? Now, this pancreas is secreting the pancreatic juices and these pancreatic juices are also secreting some enzymes. Now, what are the enzymes secreted by pancreas? Let's see, pancreas are secreting first trypsin, second lipase. And third, amylase. Pancreas are secreting pancreatic juice. And that pancreatic juice contains some type of digestive enzymes. Now, these enzymes are actually the chemicals which are not taking part in the reaction. But they are making the reaction smoothly run. So, what are the three types of pancreatic enzymes which are released? First is the trypsin. Now, this trypsin is actually to digest proteins. Now, proteins are coming through pulses which we are eating. So, those proteins have to be divided and this is helped by trypsin. The trypsin is the name of the pancreatic enzyme which is breaking down the proteins. Now, lipase is the second type of an, uh, an pancreatic enzyme which is acting upon on fats. Now, this is acting on proteins. 
This is acting upon on facts. That means the facts which we are taking in through oils and ghees. This and cheese and butter. When we are eating all these things, we are getting fats. Now these fats are to be broken down by the enzymes which are produced by pancreatic enzyme, pancreatic juice. So this pancreatic enzyme lipase acts on fats. And third is pancreatic amylase. Now as we had learned earlier, in the mouth also, the saliva had salivary amylase. So pancreas has pancreatic amylase and it acts on carbohydrates. That means the starch part or the carbohydrate part, the roti, the chapati, the potatoes, all the starchy food, it is acted upon by amylase. So these three pancreatic enzymes, the trypsin, the lipase and the amylase acts on carbohydrates, fats and proteins. And the complete digestion of these three carbohydrates, fats and proteins takes place because of the pancreatic juice which is secreted. Now there are, now here I have drawn the gallbladder which is having a duct, bile duct. Here I have drawn pancreas, it is having a duct, pancreatic duct. But you see here both the ducts are joining. Now this is the part which is called as the common duct. Now from the gallbladder the bile duct is going to come and from the pancreas the pancreatic juice is going to come and then it is getting mixed with the small intestine where all the digestion maximum digestion is over. So common duct is for bile juice as well as pancreatic juice and this common duct is formed by combination of bile duct and pancreatic duct. Here you can see it is common here and this is the dark part which I am showing. This is the common duct and this common duct produce, uh, takes the both the bile juice as well as the pancreatic juices into the small intestine to act on it where now the bile juice the bile juice is making the medium alkaline first function it is making the medium alkaline secondly pancreatic juice what is it doing it is having three enzymes now those three enzymes are first is trypsin which is acting on the proteins second is lipase which is acting on the fats and third is amylase which is acting on the carbohydrates so this is the function of pancreas and their associated structures now when this digestion is taking place now what is happening the digestion is taking place now to increase the surface area of the small intestine now, this is a small intestine the inner lining of small intestine has number of finger like structures now how i am putting my fingers it is increasing like this so this finger like structures are inside the lining of small intestine so this lining what is actually it is doing it is absorbing the digested food so it looks like the finger like projection it looks like this so this finger like projections have number of blood vessels connected to it so what is happening if there are finger like structures inside the lining of small intestine it is increasing the surface area for absorption of digested food now the digestion has taken place, now the food has to be absorbed. So the food absorption is increased many more times if there are number of this finger like projections which are called as villi, V-I-L-L-I. This villi are the finger like projections inside the lining of small intestine. What is villi doing? Villi is actually increasing the surface area of the absorption of digested food now the absorbed food is taken in by the small intestine then it has to be sent to the each cell now what happens sometimes the unused glucose or the glucose which is formed unused glucose has to be stored somewhere now where it will be stored it is generally stored in the liver part the unused glucose is stored in the liver in the form of glycogen so when it is required, that time the glucose from the liver is utilized to convert it into 
energy. So the unused glucose is, uh, is saved or stored in the liver part here. The unused glucose is stored in the liver part and this unused glucose is stored in the form of glycogen. Now the maximum digestion, almost the whole digestion has taken place in the small intestine. Now this absorbed food will be sent, is absorbed, already absorbed food is sent to the cells and the tissues. Now the rest of the food which is unused or unutilized or which is going as waste, it is sent to the large intestine. Now I have made this with the green color, this large intestine. Now in the large intestine what is happening? Now the food has been passed which is left over or waste to the large intestine. Large intestine also has villi and this villi reabsorb the water and nutrients which might not have been absorbed by the small intestine. So they also have the work of reabsorption. Reabsorption means whatever water content is left or any nutrients are left, it is reabsorbing. The large intestine is reabsorbing from the waste which is coming from the small intestine. And this is the, and then this is passed to the anus. And in the anus part, it is also actually regulated by the muscle which is called as sphincter muscle. So here also slowly and slowly the waste matter is sent from the large intestine into the anus which is regulated by the muscle which is called as sphincter muscle. It immediately does not send it. Slowly part by part it will send to the anus into the with the help of this sphincter muscle it relaxes and contracts and sends the egg through the egg into the exit through the sphincter muscles. So this is about human digestive system which we have learnt right from mouth to the anus. Hello students, welcome back to our lesson on life's internal secrets. Last time we discussed about the digestion process taking place in human beings. We saw how the digestion takes place right from the mouth till the anus, what are the procedures, what are the types of enzymes which are released for digestion of food. Now that was for animals and human beings. Now we come to the nutrition in plants. When we compare animals and plants, animals are heterotrophs and plants are autotrophs. Now why, we, why do we call them autotrophs? Auto, auto words means on their own they can make their food. So when the plants can make their own food, such type of mode of nutrition is called autotrophic mode of nutrition. Now, what are the raw materials to make food? Now, some raw materials are required by the plants. The animals don't need any raw material. They have to attack any other animals or if they are herbivores, they have to eat plants. So, this is how they take in food. But what about plants? Plants have to prepare the food. Now, this sun's energy is required along with some raw materials which are present in air, in soil and with the help of these things, the plants prepare their own food. So I can say the raw materials for the plants to prepare their food are carbon dioxide. So raw materials required for plants are first is carbon dioxide. Now carbon dioxide they are taking in through air. Then they require water. This they are taking in from soil which there the water is being absorbed by the roots. These are the raw materials. These two will react but in the presence of sunlight only. The radiant energy of sunlight is necessary to, con to react car carbon dioxide and water and form the carbohydrate and oxygen. The complete reaction of photosynthesis I will be showing you but what the process which are followed the process which is followed by plants is called as photosynthesis. Photo means light. Synthesis means to make something. So when the plants utilize light or sunlight's energy to convert carbon dioxide and water into carbohydrates, this whole process is called as photosynthesis. So what is the reaction? How can I show in the form of reaction or chemical reaction the photosynthesis? This is a very common question for one mark 
it is asked write the chemical reaction for photosynthesis so in your book also activity 10.8 complete the photosynthesis reaction they have given us one blank that we have to fill up now let's see the complete reaction of photosynthesis now these two are the raw materials let's write carbon dioxide plus water now here we have to show that it is using sunlight's energy or light energy from the sun now it is forming c6 h12 o6 plus oxygen now this c6 h12 o6 is the carbohydrate which is formed for the plant and the oxygen is released along with it this is the complete reaction now i have not balanced it now balancing part you have to try it now here c is 1 here c is 6 so we can write here c 6 co2 now in this process 6 has become 6 now here also c has become 6 what about hydrogen which is 12 so here it is 2 i can put 6 here so 6 into 2 is 12 now 12 we have made now total oxygen 6 into 2 is 12 plus 6 is 18 now here oxygen is 6 so if i make here write 6 6 to the 12 plus 6 18 so this is how you can balance the chemical equation and this is the reaction for photosynthesis very specific question if you are asked just write the chemical reaction involved in photosynthesis you have to write this reaction just remember you have to write under it what it means co2 write under it carbon dioxide h2o write under it water c6 h12 o6 is the product form write under it carbohydrate and this is oxygen form so that if you write in this way that will be the complete answer given now this is the reaction now actually what's happening in the photosynthesis step by step we can follow first the carbon dioxide which is the gas present in the air this has to enter the leaves now from where it enters the leaves the leaves have small pores on the lower side that means the leaf upper side and the lower side this is the dorsal side and this is the ventral side so when it from the lower side there are small pores present which are known as stomata these are the small pores present on the lower more on the lower side of the leaf these pores are protected by cells which are known as guard cells now these guard cells open and close as required so when it is acquiring a carbon dioxide it will open it will take in the carbon dioxide and give out oxygen when it has to open for oxygen so stomata actually is regulated by two cells which are known as guard cells stomata has guard cells so from the word we can make out that it is guarding the pore or the hole which is present in the leaf we cannot see it with our naked eyes if i just see a leaf i cannot see the stomata to see the stomata you have to take out one tissue and see it under a compound microscope you can clearly see the stomata present the stomata looks something like this these are the guard cells and this is the hole now i am making a very magnified image for you this looks this are the guard cells this hole is covered by the guard cells when the guard cells take in water and become turgid they open and when they lose water they close this is how it is regulating the opening and closing of this pore which is called as stomata so through the stomata the carbon dioxide is entering so this stomata actually is used for diffusion of gases in and out of the leaf the carbon dioxide enters now this one of the raw materials have come second raw material is water now what is happening from where the water is coming the plant has root system that those roots are absorbing water from the soil along with some nutrients so water is coming through the absorption of what no, absorption through the roots and this is how the raw materials are entering the plants now third step 
Now they are using the sunlight. That means the radiant energy of the sunlight is used up. Now what is this sunlight used up for? This sunlight, the energy of this sunlight is used to break this carb uh, water molecule into hydrogen and oxygen. Water is formed from hydrogen and oxygen. Now it has to break and then only the reaction will continue. So this breaking is done by the radiant energy absorbed by the leaf. Now which part of the leaf is absorbing this radiant energy? Now this radiant energy is absorbed by chlorophyll. Actually, is a green pigment which is present in leaves. It is it is also seen in the stems part, which is whichever part of the stem is green, that means it contains chlorophyll. Now this chlorophyll absorbs the radiant energy of the sun and then divides this water into hydrogen and oxygen. Thus, this oxygen is released in the reaction. Now, what about this carbon dioxide converting to the C6H2LO6? Now when the sunlight breaks the H2O into hydrogen and oxygen, large amount of energy is released in the form of ATP. Now when I say ATP, I mean to say that it is adenosine triphosphate. So ATP means adenosine triphosphate. This is the form, energy is released in the form of ATP. What is this ATP going to do? This ATP is going to convert carbon dioxide into carbohydrate. So the steps you have to follow uh, in completely. First step, carbon dioxide has to enter the leaf through the stomata. That is the pores which are present on the leaves on the lower side, more you are going to see on the lower side. Then second raw material is water. Water is coming through the roots, which is the roots are absorbing the water from the soil. Sunlight energy is absorbed from by the chlorophyll part. That's the pigment or the green pigment present in the leaf. Now this also is present in a type of organelle which is known as chloroplast. So it is present in chloroplast. Chloroplast is a plant organelle which contains this green pigment which is called as chlorophyll and this chlorophyll is absorbing the energy from the sun. When it has absorbed energy from the sun, it is going to break this water into hydrogen and oxygen. Once the hydrogen and oxygen are broken, then this uh, ATP is released. ATP is what? Adenosine triphosphate. This energy is going to reduce carbon dioxide to this carbohydrate. These are the steps of photosynthesis. So if you are asked a question, this question generally comes for 3 to 4 marks. If you are asked a question, you have to write stepwise in your book also stepwise uh, for the how the photosynthesis takes place is written. So if you write along with the reaction, it completes your answer. And the next part is, where is this photosynthesis taking place? In which part of the leaf it is taking place? In which part of the plant it is taking place? The photosynthesis process takes place where the green pigment is present. So the green pigment is present in the leaves or in the, um, we can say the stem part also which is green in color or any floral part which is green in color. When I say floral part, that means in the, in the flowers also the down it is covered by the petals and the sepals. Petals are colored but the sepals are green in color. So wherever green part is there, there the photosynthesis takes place. Maximum 90% photosynthesis takes place in the leaf, leaves of the plants. Now there is an activity 10.7 in your book. Please open it, we will try to solve it. In which layer must the process of photosynthesis be taking place to a greater extent and why? So read out the activity 10.7 on page 120. Now I have drawn the diagram. Based on it, the questions are asked. Let me first explain the diagram. 
This is the cross section of leaf. In the cross section of leaf, you can see the upper epidermis and the lower epidermis. Both the epidermis I have drawn quite thick. That means the upper part and the lower part is actually having the cuticle which is waxy or wax coating like a cuticle is there. Then here in between there are two types of cells. One is called chloroplast which contain chlorophyll which is actually absorbing the sun's energy and the rest of the part is filled with mesophyll cells. This, these mesophyll cells and chloroplast have lot of air spaces in between in the leaves. This is the cross section of the leaf. The lower part or the lower epidermis of the leaf, we are, I have shown you some spaces. These are actually the pores which are uh, covered by the guard cells. Now this is the highlighted part so you will see the guard cells having the pores open. So these are the stomata and these are the guard cells. Based on this diagram some questions are there. The question is in which layer must the process of photosynthesis be taking place to a greater extent and why? Now where do you see chloroplast? You see chloroplast at the upper end of the cross section. So your answer should be that, that the chloroplasts are more near the upper epidermis and that's why there the photosynthesis might be taking more in number than the lower part. And why? Why it is so? The chloroplasts are at the upper end and it is covered by the cuticle. It is easier for the chloroplast having the chlorophyll to absorb the light energy if they are on the upper part of the leaf. Now you will say the leaf is so thin, what is the upper part and the lower part? But when we have a cross section and you see under the microscope, you see there are number of cells which have different functions and this chloroplast have the function of absorbing the light energy and it is present more on the upper side of the leaf. Next question is, what is the significance of waxy cuticle on the upper and lower surface of the leaf? You can see I have drawn it quite thick and this thickness is shown because there is a waxy cuticle over it. Cuticle is nothing but the thick lining epidermis, upper layer of the epidermis becomes thick. That means two or three layers come over it and it becomes thick. Now why do you think it should be thick? There are various reasons for it. First, the loss of water should be very less. The transpiration, the process of transpiration that means the water loss from the water from the plant should be very slow it should not if this is not thick the water may be lost too fast and the plant may not get that water which is required so there should be a cuticle which does not allow the fast evaporation of water from the leaf it also act, this thick layer also prevents the entry of microorganisms to some extent not, we cannot say that all the microorganisms are stopped, but to some extent this thick cuticle also stops the microorganisms. Now, since it is a waxy layer, it does not allow the water to stay on the leaf. If the leaf, if it is a waxy layer, the water drop may come down slowly. That's why it does not allow the water to stay on the leaf. If the water is allowed to stay on, stay on the leaf, it may hinder the passage of carbon dioxide and oxygen. So these are some of the reasons of the waxy cuticle. Another reason which I can say for the plants which are found in desert area. In the desert area this cuticle is much thicker. Example cactus it is very thick because it wants the minimum loss of water because they don't get enough water to absorb. So that is in the arid area or arid region or the desert region. But normally you will find the thick cuticle in the leaves. But this was about the site of photosynthesis. There are some activities in your book which are trying to prove that carbon dioxide and water if I am not giving to the leaf whether they undergo process of photosynthesis or not. So there are two activities. The first activity will read out and I will try to explain the questions which are there. Take a potted croton plant. Now what is a croton plant? If you have seen, it is a decorative plant. It does not have flowers much. So the plant which is croton, which is called croton, it has different color patches on its leaf. It is quite thick leaf. So that type of plant you have to take. 
keep the plant in the dark room for three days. Now, if I keep the plant for in the dark room for three days, that means I am not allowing any sunlight to come. If there is no sunlight, no photosynthesis will be taking place. Then from where the energy will be coming? So whichever starch is made, wherever starch was made and it was stored in the plant, that starch will be utilized. So in three to four days, if I am keeping it in the dark place, it will be de-starched or the starch will be over for the, for the various activities of the plant. Now keep the plant in sunlight for about six hours. Now once you have de-starched the plant, you take that potted plant and keep it again in the sunlight. Minimum six hours. Pluck a leaf of the plant and mark the green areas. Now one leaf, one big thick leaf you can take out and wherever green areas are there, mark it. Now as I said, croton is a plant having different colors on their leaves. So those different colors, you may see reddish color, you may see orangish color, you may see yellowish color. That's the croton speciality. And then you may see the green color also. So wherever green color is there, you mark it with the dark sketch pen. Now immerse the leaf in a beaker containing alcohol. Now this leaf we are taking, first we have to boil it in the alcohol. Now what I am going to do with alcohol? The alcohol is going to remove all the chlorophyll. So all the chlorophyll will be absorbed in the alcohol. Can I keep this alcohol, boiling alcohol directly over the flame? No, you need a water bath. Now it's not written but you need a water bath over it. Alcohol in a beaker you will take. Keep it in the water bath. Water bath means you have to take one crucible glass container, put water in it, heat it and then put this beaker with the alcohol. What are we doing with it? We are not directly, uh, um, actually the alcohol is not coming directly in contact with the heat and this is called the heating in a water bath. Immerse the leaf in a beaker containing alcohol. Now immerse Carefully place the above beaker in water bath and heat the alcohol till it begins to boil. Now we have to wait till the heat reaches the alcohol and it starts boiling. Now when it starts boiling, what will happen? What happens to the color of the leaf? The leaf becomes decolorized. Why? Because the alcohol is absorbing all the chlorophyll. In fact, the water alcohol will become greenish in color because it has taken all the green pigment in it. What is the color of solution? The color of solution is greenish in color. Reason for it? Because alcohol has absorbed all the chlorophyll. Now take this, immerse the leaf in the dilute solution of iodine for few hours. Now iodine is used for testing the presence of starch. Anywhere, you take a, a raw potato and cut it into half and you see, it just put a two drops of iodine, it will turn bluish black in color showing that potato has lot of starch same way what are we going to do with iodine solution here iodine solution is we are testing the iodine solution for the presence of starch that this leaf which has undergone so many things now we have first de-starched then we have put it in the sunlight for six hours then we have plucked one leaf and then we have boiled put it in the boiling alcohol so that all the chlorophyll is taken out once the chlorophyll is taken out, that means the color of the leaf becomes, it is decolorized. Then we are testing with iodine solution. Observe the color of leaf, especially the marked areas. Now the marked areas, where did we mark it? We marked it on the green parts. The green parts, if I had kept in the sunlight, that green part had chlorophyll. Then that means it must have made starch. So the green part will turn bluish in color and the non-green parts, parts will become yellowish or pale yellow in color. So this proves that the green parts which have turned bluish in color in the iodine presence, that means it, it had made starch with the help of photosynthesis. This is the whole activity is just to tell you that uh, if I de-starch the plant and I try to uh, see whether the starch is formed after keeping in the sunlight whether I am getting the result for the iodine test or not yes we are getting the result that means we are proving that chlorophyll is necessary for the conversion of carbon dioxide and water into carbohydrate in short 
chlorophyll is very necessary for the process of photosynthesis. So this is the activity which you have to understand and you have to answer the questions wherever it is asked. Second activity. Now we are going to see whether carbon dioxide is necessary for photosynthesis. Again the activity is written. I will try to explain you and answer the questions. Take two healthy potted plants which are of same size. Two potted plants almost same size we have to take and again de-starch it. Keep it in plant, keep the plant in dark for about three to four days. That means what's happening? The starch is being utilized. No uh, photosynthesis takes place. So it is called de-starched plant. Now place each plant on a separate glass plate and place a watch glass containing potassium hydroxide. I'll show you what it means. Now they have taken two potted plants. If I draw one potted plant like this, okay, and here another one, now this is kept on a glass plate, both of them, and covered with a bell jar. Now why it is called bell jar means it is, so if I turn it upside down, it looks like a bell. So it is covered with a bell jar and in one of the bell jar a dish is kept which is filled with KOH solution and in other no solution of KOH is added and this is sealed now with the Vaseline down or anything sealing thing we can seal it so that no air goes out from outside this dish contains KOH solution. This is the setup. What was done? Two potted plants were taken. They were kept in dark for some hours, for some, not for hours, for three days. All the starch was used up. Then they were removed. Then they kept in the sunlight for some time. Then these two potted plants were covered with the bell jars. And in one of the bell jar, a dish was taken and potassium hydroxide solution was kept. Now what is this solution doing? It is absorbing carbon dioxide present in the air inside the bell jar. This KOH is absorbing all the carbon dioxide present in the bell jar. But till here this is the activity. Keep the plants in sunlight for two hours now. Now after Everything is sealed, everything is kept. Now keep again for sunlight for two hours. Pluck a leaf from each plant and check for the presence of starch. Now what has happened? Here KOH has absorbed all the carbon dioxide. Sunlight is coming. Because this is transparent bell jar, sunlight is coming. There may be some moisture in the potted plant out inside the soil. So it is getting water. But the air which is trapped inside the bell jar, the carbon dioxide present in the air is absorbed by the KOH solution and here there is no KOH solution. So where do you think if I pluck one leaf here and one leaf here and test for the iodine test, where will I get the test for iodine positive? Now here in this, let's name it A and B. So this pot A and pot B. Pot B will show the starch test because it has formed starch, it has got the carbon dioxide, it has got the water and it has got the sunlight, all the raw materials were there and they formed the starch. But in this potted plant, carbon dioxide was absorbed by KOH. So the carbon dioxide was not there for formation of starch. So here the starch test will be negative. Negative means it will not show blue black color when I put iodine solution over this leaf. But here the starch solution, starch iodine test will be positive. As every raw material was available to it and therefore the starch will turn blue black in color when I put iodine. So this proves, this experiment proves that carbon dioxide is one of the very important raw material for 
photosynthesis in plants. So, we saw photosynthesis requires two main types of raw materials carbon dioxide, water. Now, in the presence of sunlight, but only carbon dioxide and water, nothing else is required for the development of the plant or the proper growth of the plant. There are many nutrients also required which are in the form of inorganic salts. If you have heard about the fertilizer NPK, this is the most common fertilizer found. This fertilizer contains three major type of nutrients which are covering nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. So, I can say these nutrients are also important along with the carbohydrate which is formed. Carbohydrate which is formed is providing us energy. Now, how it is this energy is provided? This carbohydrate will be oxidized by oxygen during respiration. Now, we are going to learn next part respiration, but for that you should know that carbohydrate is providing us energy. This energy requirement is coming from carbohydrate and nutrients are helping in the energy requirement. These nutrients nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, calcium, these are all coming out from the soil and so when the water is absorbed, water is absorbed along with these nutrients which are present in the soil in some form of compound. So, nutrient content is also requirement. Then another thing is some nitrogen is very important for synthesis of proteins and this proteins there are some plants which are actually requiring more of nitrogen and if the nitrogen is less then they have to find out some other ways to take that nutrient of nitrogen. One example I will tell you, there is a uh, example of insectivorous plant which is known as pitcher plant. Pitcher plant if you have heard, it looks like a pitcher, pitcher I mean it looks like like this. So, here one leaf is there and this is actually a plant. What is happening? This leaf is covering the upper part and here if an insect is sitting, it traps that insect, takes that insect inside and that is why it is called a insectivorous plant. This picture plant wherever it grows, there the nitrogen content is less. So, it grows in that type of soil where the nitrogen content is generally found less. So, it has to take the nutrients like nitrogen from somewhere else. So, it this plant has been adapted in such a way that it traps the insects. These insects are acted over by the various enzymes present in the lining of the pitcher plant and these enzymes act on the uh, insect, trap it, it dies and then it ex extracts all the nutrients from its body and therefore it is called a insectivorous plant. This is just an information where the plants if they do not get some nutrients they adapt to some other way of taking the nutrients from the nature.